The Battle of Shiloh, one of the bloodiest of the American Civil War, was an important event during the struggle for control of the Mississippi River. When federal forces advancing down the Mississippi were halted by Confederate fortifications at Island Number no. 10, Major General Henry Halleck dispatched Ulysses S. Grant on riverboats up the Tennessee River to Pittsburgh Landing, a short distance from the railroad hub at Corinth, Mississippi. Capturing Corinth would allow Grant to threaten Memphis and possibly cut the flow of supplies and reinforcements to the troublesome Confederate forts. Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard anticipated just such a move and had scraped together at Corinth General Albert Sidney Johnson and every available soldier, which still amounted to an army slightly smaller than Grant's. Worse still, another federal army under Major General Don Carlos Buell was marching from Nashville to join Grant. It was therefore decided to attack while the numbers were still about even. This attack was the beginning of the Battle of Shiloh. Our players were scattered across three states, so we opted to play remotely. The battlefield was a two foot by two and a half foot terrain model I made using the easy map technique shown in another one of our videos. Each division was assigned a number of stands of miniatures based on its strength, which worked out to approximately one stand per historical brigade. Game labels were placed on the bottom of each to make them more photogenic. In this scenario, the Confederate Army would be badly outnumbered, with just 18 stands of troops against 20 under Grant and another 8 under Buell. So just how did our General Johnson plan to overcome this disparity of numbers? I'm Alec. I'm playing the role of Albert Sidney Johnston in the refight of Shiloh here. Um, our plan is a headlong assault on uh, Prentice's division, followed by a hitting Sherman's division. Our hope is to break both of them before any other Yankees get into the fight. Um, also, to improve our chances a bit, uh, we ensured that the Yankees intercepted a dispatch with a false Confederate battle plan, so hopefully they will divert troops to an attack on their flank that is never going to come. Our Confederate players were given the option of attacking from up to five different directions. Counters for each division and independent brigade were hidden in matchboxes placed at each entry point. The matchboxes were then shuffled and one box was drawn at each entry point each turn. Our Grant would not know if he was being outflanked and our Johnson would not know when an outflanking division would arrive. The Confederates elected to send Cheatham's division on an outflanking move to enter from the Purdy Road entry point where there were three matchboxes. One matchbox was drawn in the morning, another at midday, and the third in the afternoon. The victory conditions were simply to drive the enemy from the field by inflicting losses or by capturing the federal supply base at Pittsburgh Landing. Our game began in the early morning hours of the 6th of April, 1862, with the Federals preparing for another day of drill, when suddenly... The Confederate divisions of Withers and Clark attacked Sherman's and Prentice's divisions by surprise, with a substantial positive combat modifier, while Grant was away, leaving our Union Army of the Tennessee leaderless. Prentice suffered major losses and was forced to fall back, abandoning his camp at Barnes Field before forming a new line in the Davis Wheat Field. Hardy's division, following behind Clark's up the eastern Corinth Road, took up the attack, driving both Prentice and Stewart further back and capturing the sunken road. The Confederate advance towards Pittsburgh Landing was then blocked by Hurlbut's division, giving Prentice and Stewart some much needed protection to reform. Meanwhile, Sherman, defending from behind a stream, was able to hold initially until Bragg followed up the initial attack with Ruggles' division. Sherman's left near Shiloh Church broke before the Zouaves of Gibson's brigade, and Sherman was forced to retreat up the Corinth Road. Things were going well for our Confederates at this point. Their initial surprise attacks had been a spectacular success. But at this point, Grant had returned to his army. Rather than defending and awaiting Buell, he decided to seize the initiative and counterattack with 
every unit available. I am Mark, Mark McLaughlin. I'm a game designer and author. I've written, I've written books on the Civil War. I am playing the role of Eustace Simpson Grant tonight. Uh, I got hit hard, uh, had some good roles, had some weak roles. So I've stabilized the line. I'm holding from, from um, Sherman's original camp all the way through the uh, hornet's nest, all the way down to the river in a solid line of guys. Um, however, I have taken some serious losses and I'm one brigade away from going to the first level of, of bad, which is wavering. Uh, but it's in the middle of the day, turn three, uh, and I actually got the initiative, so I get to go first. Um, and I'm going to do what I've been doing all day long, which is, you know, fix bayonets, union forever. Hurrah, boys. Hurrah. On his left, Grant personally led McClernand's division in a counterattack that drove back Hardy and recaptured the sunken road. Then, on Grant's right, W.H.L. Wallace's division advanced and crushed Ruggles' spent division. To save the situation, Bragg was forced to form a grand battery near the Shiloh Church, and Johnson committed his reserve corps under Breckenridge, who was able to halt Wallace, resulting in a stalemate in this location. The battle continued by the sunken road for the rest of the morning and into the afternoon, with both sides trading blows and nearing exhaustion. Grant looked for Lew Wallace's division to reinforce him from the north, while Johnson hoped for the fresh troops under the badly delayed General Cheat. One more successful push by either side would decide the battle, but neither of these reinforcing divisions arrived. As the afternoon wore on, Johnson sensed the battle was turning against him. He rode up and down the line, urging his brigades forward, but it was to no avail. With his own army nearing the breaking point, and with the knowledge that Buell would be arriving the next day, General Johnson ordered a retreat. Grant's army, which had suffered even greater losses than Johnson's, was in no condition to pursue. So, we called it a night. 